No, we have with us Robert Riley. He is the author of a brand new book, Making Gay Okay. Robert served in the White House as special assistant to the president until 85. He was an advisor to the U.S. Secretary of Defense uh, until 06. His previous book is The Closing of the Muslim Mind, How Intellectual Suicide Created the Modern Islamic, Islamic Crisis. And uh, I wanted Robert to come on today, uh, his brand new book, Making Gay Okay, How Rationalized and Homosexual Behavior is Changing Everything. Very, very Mamma Mia interesting book. Robert, good morning, sir. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's a delight to be with you this morning. I totally appreciate you being here. How how do the gays um, rationalize? How do they do that? They do it the way the rest of us do when we've decided to do something that uh, we know is wrong. But we can't do it until we present it to ourselves as something that is right. Aristotle explains in the ethics the little psychological dynamo that we have to go through in order to choose evil. We have to make up an imaginary world in which the evil becomes a good so that uh, I really can steal the other person's possessions, but it won't really be stealing. I'll be taking back my own. Or I can take the other man's wife because really... He never loved her, and I do. You know, the rationalizations hey, so go on forever. The, the unique thing regarding the homosexual rationalizations for their misbehavior is when they decide to make it the centerpiece of their lives. It's as if one wished to be a professional thief, so one had to rationalize stealing on a permanent basis in one's moral imagination. Yeah. So, too, does uh, uh, someone who wants to make sodomitical acts or sodomitical marriage the centerpiece of life. They have to then create a more permanent rationalization, making this profoundly morally disordered act into a good act. Uh, Very interesting. The, the, the thing is, that it's, it's, that's, that's just part of the job. They can do that for themselves, but it won't really work unless they can persuade those around them that this rationalization is really true. Yeah, I was so going to say the system doesn't, uh, does not accept this rationalization for the most part, that, right? No, yeah, well, see, that's exactly the problem. Unless they can universalize the rationalization, they're always in danger. Uh, the rationalization is always in danger, and as a consequence of which, all the guilt that would normally accrue to their behavior would then come crashing in on them. So they are they have to evangelize for their rationalization and tell everybody that gay is good and that sodomy is a perfectly fine and moral act as long as you love the person. Yeah, I have now, been saying have for I've been saying for a long time that. Homosexuals who are pushing this know that they are wrong. Inside, within themselves, they have guilt. And they, it, they think that if they can convince the world that homosexuality is normal, then the guilt would go away. But I believe that the guilt would still be there because it's wrong, even if everybody says that it's right. But you're already there. That's, you, you've diagnosed this whole thing. Absolutely correctly. That's this. This is a process by which to get rid of guilt by killing one's conscience. And the only way you can successfully do it is if you get everyone to agree to the rationalization. You universalize it. You do that by campaigning. And then when you get to the point of success that they have today, you get the levers of government, of the courts, of the executive branch, and enforce the rationalization through the power of the government. Yeah. So if someone doesn't want to cater a homosexual wedding, if someone doesn't want to make a floral arrangement for a homosexual wedding, they're the ones who are persecuted 
those are the ones who su- are sued, and uh, they have had to pay some hefty fines or face jail time. So enforcement is the last step in enforcing the rationalization. But the folks who are enforcing these laws, and are they pretending uh, to think that homosexuality is normal? Are they doing it just for the money and power? Or uh, have they been convinced that homosexuality is fine or that is normal? Well, as Malcolm Muggeridge said, people do not believe lies because they have to. They believe them because <laughs> they want to. And they want to believe these lies because those lies allow them to engage in the, their preferred behavior. And that's why when you argue with someone in the homosexual movement, they're not arguing with you to reach the truth. They're arguing with you so they can continue their behavior. And they will do it either by out screaming you and shutting you up um, or changing the conversation in such a way that it never reaches its conclusion. Yes. So that, that's the, uh, that's the social, social dynamics of this thing that are going on. And to everyone's surprise, uh, the success has reached the point that in our foreign policy, the gay pride day flag is flying over our embassies. I spoke of that. I saw that in Israel where they they have the gay flag, so-called gay pride flag, right underneath the American flag there. I saw it in the... U.S. Embassy in Madrid, because my wife is Spanish, and there was the gay flag flying under the U.S. flag. I just thought, are the Marines there? Is the Marine detachment supposed to salute that? (laughs) That's amazing. You quote someone as saying, every evil is its own good. Yeah, hell of a lock. And you also say that calling homosexuality good is like calling euthanasia life a call in partial birth abortion love. That, I mean, I thought those examples were so good. They do, but that's, the, you know, that's nothing I made up. I'm just quoting people who actually did those things as samples of how rationalizations for moral misbehavior fundamentally distort reality. They, they create a false reality that gives their behavior a new context in which they can say it's good. Now, any normal operating person would most likely recover. Reality would reassert itself, and they'd say, oh, my heavens, look what I've done. I did this bad, bad thing. Now I admit to myself it was bad. I'm going to make restitution for it and repent. And so moral reality is restored, and life continues. But when you make the rationalization permanent, you then have to universalize it, and uh, that's what the culture war is about, and we're at the latter stages of that war now that they are seizing the power in the government in order to enforce the rationalization on all of us. I, um, I sometimes wonder, um, is it, well, I don't wonder, I think I know already, is it fair to the homosexuals for those people who know that is wrong is it fair to them to go along with it, knowing that the homosexuals are suffering from this? And should, or should we just be honest with them and hope that they will overcome? I'll let you answer that when we come back, Robert, from this break. 888-775-3773. Okay, welcome back. I have to tell you, folks, uh, I'm talking to an author of, the author of Making Gay Okay. Robert Riley, and how rationalizing homosexual behavior is changing everything. And it's a must, with a capital M, read book. It's a must read. And the thing I like about it is that Robert is very smart, educated, but yet he has common sense. And in this book, He's talking about things that will really help you overcome anything if you really read it and get where he's coming from. 
it will cause you to come out of denial in your own personal lives about anything, really, and stop rationalizing bad behavior, and then you can overcome and just be free people, men and women. You got to get this book, Making Gay Okay. I know when you hear Making Gay Okay, it sounds like, oh, it sounds like he's saying gay is okay, but no, that's not what it is. The attempt to make it okay is where the problem is. Um, Robert, I'm surprised that, and I, this is my first time meeting you, of course, and it's an honor to meet you and talk to you and also to read your book. Um, just a little bit of background. You are, is it true that you're a Catholic? Yes. Um, how are you able to see deep into what's really going on? Because you have to have a certain insight to understand it in the depth that you have understood or you, under, you are understanding what's happening here. Well, I'll tell you, this book is not a Catholic book, as you probably know. Yes. And in it, there are no references to Scripture right. or religion. And that was very deliberate, because I know in the public square today, all you have to do is start quoting from St. Paul, and people will tell you, oh, that's very nice, now why don't you go home, because that's a private matter, your religion. I'm not of your religion, so leave me alone. Right. So I thought, fine, I will write a book that simply sets out from the basis of reason on what we can understand about our sexual powers and human flourishing and give the case from reason as to why homosexual acts are inherently morally disordered and why sanctifying sodomy is a profound wrong. I, I had some advantages in this. First of all, I, I had studied philosophy and theology. Uh, in my professional life as an actor, I had worked in the homosexual subculture, so I saw how it worked up front. And also I had served in the military, so when it was suggested that uh, what a wonderful thing it would be if we allow homosexuals to openly operate in the military, I knew the bad consequences that would produce. And as you know, there is a chapter in the book on sodomy in the military yes. telling the story how this was foisted upon the military and uh, from my experience what consequences will obtain from this. But I do that with every institution of society, sodomy in science, sodomy in education, sodomy in the Boy Scouts, to show how implacably... These homosexual activists have gone through to seize all of the major civic institutions, then the governmental institutions, then the levers of powers with which to enforce their rationalization on the rest of us so that the price uh, for speaking the way we are this morning is going to get higher and higher and higher until yeah. we're silenced. They, uh, they have gone as far as uh, um, brainwashing or whatever they want to call it. They call it educating, educating young children now from yes. preschool that homosexuality is normal. There's nothing wrong with it. They're teaching that same-sex parents and all that stuff to the children. Ask the kid, and kids know that is wrong. They, they, they know it's wrong, and in many cases, they're not afraid to say that it's wrong. But by the time those kids become adults, will they naturally think that it's fine, or will there be something about them to let them know that it is wrong, even though they've been taught all their lives that it's fine? Well, the, the propaganda begins um, even in kindergarten in which uh, homosexuals make presentations about how normal their lives are, or the literature, the children's stories they are given, where the princess doesn't marry the princess. The prince doesn't marry the princess. The prince marries another prince, you see. Yeah. Also yeah. charming. So that propaganda is taking place now, and um, it is another indication that not even the innocence of children will stand in the way of the promotion of this rationalization for homosexual misbehavior. So the children will be swallowed up in this as well. And the other thing is uh, they will see the whole culture giving in to this. 
Right. So, so the chances of their recovery as they grow up will be less because um, it, they will see all the public institutions in their life reinforcing the propaganda they received in schools. So it's very hard to know how to reform your life if everyone is forbidden from speaking about virtue. That's amazing to me. You um, you give other examples in the book. There, uh, Nazi doctor Carl, is it Brandt? Yeah. Brandt said, death can be deliverance. Death is life. That's rationalizing death, right? Well, it was. As you know, Dr. Carl Brandt was Hitler's uh, personal physician and in charge of the Actian T4 program to um, murder uh, large numbers of handicapped people. And uh, that's the excuse he came up for that, that death is life, and so that killing these people was a laudable part laudable act on his part. Um, I use that example simply to show how an entire society, supposedly very culturally sophisticated, can be taken over by a rationalization uh, to the extent that they begin killing, uh, well, in that case, many millions of innocent people for no other reason than either that they're handicapped or they're Jewish or enslave them if they're Slavs. Now, certain people objected. If they if they objected loudly, they themselves would end up in those camps. Yeah. Also, but it, that's uh, simply an example of the extent to which things can go when a lie about who man is, a rationalization made to permit certain behavior seizes the whole society, what what men are capable of under the cover of that rationalization. And it's very, very dark stuff, and we are headed in the same direction. Yeah, we heard, as you mentioned in the book, Barber, Senator Barber Bosser said, uh, uh, women buried those babies with love, uh, speaking of abortion, she has rationalized abortion to a point that she thinks that, uh, or partial birth abortion, I'm sorry, she thinks that the women are doing it with love or out of love for the, for the babies. Right, they're killing, they're killing their babies out <laughs> of love. That's, that's right out of Carl Brandt's playbook. They love them to death. It's, it's such the distortion of reality engaged in that statement to justify their behavior is uh, extraordinary. But that's the whole nature of the rationalization. It's a self-just... They're not trying to be just. They're trying to justify themselves. Yes. And the, the guilt that would come crashing in on them, should anyone pierce that rationalization, that's what they fight against in the social and political order, is protecting the rationalization by stopping people like us who would otherwise say, oh, wait a minute now, that is not right. Yeah. That is a profoundly immoral thing you're doing. And I, again, uh, hold, Jesse, I make my... I hold make that thought, Robert. I'm so okay. sorry. Let me take a quick break. Don't forget your point. Back in a moment. I have to, This is my final segment with my guest, Robert Riley, and his book, uh, We Have Not Done Justice to It This Morning, you must, it's a must read, Making Gay Okay. And how rationalizing homosexual behavior is changing everything. Uh, Robert, tell the folks how to get your book. Oh, thank you, Jesse. Well, they can go on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or find it in bookstores. Um, do you remember? Or, or they can go to Ignatius Press and buy it from them. Oh, okay. So it's, it's easy to get. Making gay okay. Um, you were, you were making a point before we run out of time here. You were making a point, and I don't remember what it was, before the break. I don't either. Oh, I understand. Well, my other question is, I noticed that when we are in a state of denial, you can rationalize anything. I know people who have gone after other people simply because they were did not agree with them or they were angry about something, 
and they went to the limit to try to destroy those people or that person. And when you remind them that, you know what, what you're doing is evil, you're evil, they, it's like they, they are shocked by the word you are, the words you are evil, and they'll go yeah. after you for reminding them that they're evil. Well, you know, that's a very good point you make. Uh, the British writer George Orwell in the 20th century made this statement. He said, the more a society drifts from truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. Unquote. So we've reached a certain point regarding these sexual things that if we insist on speaking the truth regarding them and saying, as you do, wait a minute, this is wrong, this is evil, you may be sure that uh, those who wish to continue that activity will hate those who say those things because they endanger the rationalization that allows them to continue their behavior, and that's what they want to do. So it, it is, um, we are obliged to resist this, to refuse to be complicit with it, and to stand up and tell the truth, even though that will cost us. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I have, for the last 24 years or so, I've done truckloads of interviews, uh, uh, radio, TV, and print, and there have been times when the interviewer would say, don't say that, before the interview, they would say, don't say that homosexuality is a sin, even though they, they disagree with it personally, but they are afraid of being attacked or maybe losing a job or something like that. What would happen if we don't stop it, if we don't stop homosexuality? Well, we will, you know, it, uh, when people ask me this, they say, look, there are so few homosexuals who are going to get married. What difference does it make? And I ask them, what difference does it make if a few people uh, interject counterfeit currency into the U.S. dollar? Yeah. Why should that bother you if we've got some counterfeiter who's printing <laughs> bills in his label, so he's, he's interjecting a false currency into a real currency? Will that affect you? And the answer is, of course, it will affect you because the counterfeit currency devalues the real currency. Yeah. Your currency becomes debased, and at the point that everyone ac acknowledges the fact that your, counter your currency has gone counterfeit, then it loses its value, and the whole economy and society can be endangered because of it. So, likewise, accepting something that isn't marriage as marriage devalues real marriage when you let the counterfeit marriage in. And it's going to be very socially destructive. Absolutely, absolutely. I want to just squeeze in a, at least one caller here, someone that, a good friend of sure. mine, I want to speak to you. Uh, a guy from Phoenix, go ahead, guy, you're on with Robert. Hey, uh, good morning, Jesse. Good, good morning. morning, Robert, and I'm going to buy your book as soon as I hang up from here, okay? Thank you. <laughs> uh, one one question: uh, If you there's a lot of people like Jesse, myself, yourself that are are strong, willing men, and uh, if they believe in the Bible, mm -hmm. they know what they're being taught, mm -hmm. and they and they won't let rationalization uh, take over their mind. Mm -hmm. Because I will never believe that uh, mm -hmm. uh, marriage between uh, two men or two women is the right thing. Right. So I uh, I can't believe. In other words, if you take a uh, if you take if everybody reads your book, they'll find that out. I can't rationalize it. No one can show me where it's right anywhere where it's right in the Bible, the Bible that I believe in. And um, so what I'm saying, if you come back out and you fight, say, hey, you can't rationalize it. That that's just like uh, uh, when you go to a diversity class, you have certain people there. But you don't have anybody like they don't have a past there uh, to, for the Christians. You see what I'm getting at? Right, of course. So what well, we the, need to the, do is just step up and say, "Hey, you can jump up and down. You can say, I'll never believe it. Yeah. If I'm the last man standing, let's get a response guy because we're running out of time here. Yeah. Go ahead, Robert. Yeah, they. Well, well, that's good because you're a man of faith and you can't be shaken by this. But the problem is. While you're, you'll be okay, uh, everyone else might not be. And if you go into the public square and start quoting from Scripture, 
they won't listen to you. They'll tell you to go home because they'll say, that's a private matter, your religion. I'm, I don't happen to share that religion, so why don't you go home and just practice your religion privately? Mm-hmm. That's why this book sets forth the arguments from reason about how to use our sexual powers uh, correctly for our own human flourishing without any reference to scripture or religion. I use Socrates, Plato, Aristotle to show how the notions of chastity have to be at the heart of a healthy society to regulate those sexual passions and what happens when a society abandons them. There's nothing new in this. we been through it before, and our civilization was based in a large part on classical Greek philosophy, which laid out these issues in ways that are far more uh, easy to put forth in the public square today, because they're not tainted by religion, and they're extremely persuasive. So in this book, I try to give people like you the rational arguments to use in the public square today to refute the rationalization for homosexual behavior. And I have to say, Robert, you do an excellent job of that, too. When people read this, it, it, it will help them deal with these, this issue in the public square because you're right. They'll just turn you off if you quote scriptures. You don't really have to quote scriptures in order to put the truth out there. I love the way you're doing it in the book. God, I'll thank you. Thank, hey, thank you, Robert. Yeah. You're an honorable man, thank, sir. Yeah. Thank, thank you, God. sir. I appreciate God. that. I have to tell you, I was in New York speaking um, the other night on this issue, and uh, separately two homosexuals came up Robert, to me. Robert, just hold that. I'm just going to let you finish that thought. We will come back, and then we'll run. Back in a moment. For hold, remember that thought, Robert. Don't forget it. You got to get Making Gay Okay by Robert R. Riley. Robert Riley. How rationalizing homosexual behavior is changing everything. There's a story in the book. There are many, but there's one in the book where a, a young guy or a man was talking about what he went through um, being raised by two lesbians uh, and how he had no male influence. And because it was two women raising him, he didn't have that, he didn't grow up with that, knowing what it was to have a mother, a feminine woman, a mother, and knowing what it was to have a father. So he grew up not being able to offer society neither masculinity or feminism because of the way he it was he was raised. It's so interesting to hear this story or read this story that I've not heard anyone put it in this way before. If you want to know how to really deal with this issue in the public square, whether it's in your family or you're out talking to some stupid politician or a homosexual, you got to get making gay okay. How rationalizing homosexual behavior is changing everything by Robert Riley. I'm telling you, folks, it is... Good. Robert, you were making a point about uh, you were giving a speech and two homosexuals approached you, and what happened? Yeah, yeah, this was up in New York the night before last, and I gave a talk based upon this book, Making Gay Okay. And separately, two homosexuals, both of whom belong to this great organization called Courage, in which they tried to leave, uh, lead chaste lives and good lives inside the church. And they came up and so warmly thanked me for the book. Uh, That meant a lot to me. Because as you might imagine, on homosexual websites, I'm vilified and called a hater and a homophobe. And for these guys to come up and and so warmly shake my hand and so genuinely thank me for what I I say and do uh, means a lot. In In the very way in which you... You know, people who tell homosexuals, go ahead, uh, do what you want, Um, this is all warm and fuzzy, let's sanctify your sodomy in a marriage. They're condescending to those people. Yes. They they are expecting them to behave less than as fully human beings, 
because they have this inclination, go ahead, give in to it. That's condescending to them. What What is a respect is saying, wait a minute, you may not have that inclination through any fault of your own, but if you engage in it, it is going to harm you, and it's going to harm the person with whom you engage in it. And the best thing for you to do, if you, there are various ways in which you can approach this problem, uh, but you'll be a better human being if you do it. And that's what the Courage uh, Organization does, and it's an inspiration to see the brave young men who are doing that. Of course. I, so I, I believe that I, I that my work is a sign of respect to them. You you treat them as moral creatures capable of moral decisions, um, who therefore need to take that hard look at what whether they are doing is good or evil, because their souls are at stake in this. I th- I take it, and you're absolutely right. And to add to what you said. To be honest with these people without resenting them, you're really showing them love. You're saying that what you're doing is wrong, it's not right, no matter how you try to rationalize it. You're saying you got to, you should take a look at it in order to overcome so you can find peace. Even if they're calling you names or they're trying to block you in some kind of a way, I think we still have a responsibility to be honest with these people in hopes that some of them would come out of this denial state and accept it and overcome it. And some do when you're honest with them and don't resent them, but don't go along with it either. Yeah, well, they do. I mean, the the success rate uh, amongst homosexuals who want to change their orientation is really quite significant. So there are therapies that do work uh, there, there are groups like Courage that, even if the orientation isn't changed, they are given the means by which to lay, lead good, chaste lives. Yeah. Uh, so they don't have to concede to the rationalization and lead a life in a moral morass. And this book, Jesse, I hope can help them think through just at the level of reason Yes. Why this action is a misuse of your body, that your body was designed for other purposes, and when you use it for purposes for which it was not designed, you will harm your body, you will harm yourself, and you will harm others. Uh, well, well, I, yeah. be- I believe, Robert, that this book is going to help not only the homosexuals who are in denial, I think it's going to help people who are in denial about anything because it's so well written and it really causes you to think about life itself and about denials of, denial about anything. So I, I, well, I think you've done a really a great thing here. Thank you, Jesse. I think that's a key, key point in the book that we can't lay the major portion of blame on homosexuals for what's happening in our society because we've had a prior half century, at least from the sexual revolution in the 1960s, of heterosexuals who have been rationalizing their misbehavior yes. in extramarital sex, premarital yeah. sex, pornography, uh, serial no-fault divorce, um, abortion, and all of these rationalizations feed into each other, so they become a source of support for the homosexual rationalization. Here's the way this dynamo works. I'll support the rationalization for your sexual misbehavior if you support my <laughs> rationalization for my sexual misbehavior. Exactly. That's, that's it. And that's why you find, almost without exception, active homosexuals supporting abortion. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know... Uh, Pornographers supporting gay rights. I mean, it's because it's yeah. it's yeah. all part of the same larger rationalization for sexual misbehavior. Robert, it's an honor meeting you, and thank you for your work. Thank you so much for having me. All God right. bless you, Jesse. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Back in a moment, folks. Okay, folks. you got to get the book. I do recommend this book, really. Making Gay Okay, How Rationalizing Homosexual Behavior... It's changing everything. Robert Riley. 
Be sure to check it out, all right?